Good afternoon and welcome to the 200th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we start the congressional COVID calls discussions with my guest, United States House Representative Chrissy Houlihan. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, January 12, 2021, there are 1,954,383 deaths from COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 22,740,360 cases in the United States, and there are 378,849 deaths from COVID-19 reported today in the United States. That's up from 375,350 reported yesterday. We'll read an obituary a little bit later in the program after I have spoken with the representative and I'd like to bring her out now and introduce her to you. Really been looking forward to this conversation. Hi. Thanks Chrissy, for having me. You bet. Let me just give a brief introduction. Chrissy Houlihan is an Air Force veteran, an engineer, a serial entrepreneur, an educator, and a nonprofit leader. She's now in her second term representing Pennsylvania's sixth congressional district, which encompasses Chester County and Southern Berks County. She serves on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Small Business Committee. She is incredibly busy, as you can imagine. I'm so pleased to welcome her to Coven Calls. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Representative Houlihan, where are you calling from? This is where I usually start the program. Could you tell us where you're calling from and how the pandemic is looking there today? Of course, I'm calling from Washington, D.C. I am down here as of this afternoon for a couple of votes that will be taking place this evening and then again tomorrow. Uh, the city of Washington has, just like the city of Philadelphia and the suburbs of Philadelphia, been really struggling with the pandemic. Uh, and so I don't think that they, uh, Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia are terribly dissimilar in our uh, approach to trying to combat the disease as well. I have to ask you about your experience on January 6th. I mean, I'm a historian. I had a historian on yesterday. We're struggling for precedence. Can you tell us a little bit about your day on, on January 6th? Oh, it was a very um, hard day, and I think it was a hard day for everyone. Uh, for me in particular, I was actually here for the bulk of the morning uh, working on my floor remarks for what I expected in our delegation, expected to be an objection to the state of Pennsylvania's election results. I finished those election, uh, I'm sorry, that, that speech up at around one o'clock uh, with the anticipation of heading over to the floor uh, to see Arizona. Um, be refuted or objected to. Uh, it turned out that around 1.15 or so was when I started getting messages that uh, the Capitol was frankly under attack. Uh, I worked very expediently to get to uh, the Capitol to make sure that I was within the Capitol infrastructure so I could place votes uh, and spent the majority of the time within the Capitol structure from about 1.15 or so till about 8 when I was able to return to the floor and uh, object to the objection about Pennsylvania's election results. For, uh, finished around four o'clock in the morning and then was back at it around uh, seven or eight the next day. I know legislators want to be part of history, but what an extraordinary thing. And, and most of us were watching it live on TV and didn't know what was going on. Did, same experience for you? Did you have much of a sense of what was to, happening? Yeah, to some degree, it was not dissimilar. I mean, I was also literally barricaded in my office with my um, television on very low uh, behind several different locked doors, um, listening to and watching the news, texting with my colleagues uh, to make sure everybody was safe. Um, so it was not, I don't think, different than a lot of people's experience of watching surreal images of people that I know and places that I haunt, you know, uh, and, and, and the world watching such an incredible institution as the Capitol and the United States under attack. 
Uh, I'm really eager to get your sense of how what happened then and frankly what's happened politically throughout the year is connected to the pandemic. How do you see the connection between those two things? I do see a connection. And in fact, um, some of the motivations for me running for Congress in 2016 and, and being here now in my second term kind of stemmed from my concern about where we were heading as a nation um, and kind of the importance of science and truth, to be terribly honest. As you mentioned in the introduction, I'm an engineer uh, and I am a former chemistry teacher. And part of my motivation for raising my hand to run for this particular office at a national level was an interest in science and truth and data. Uh, and I think that the moment met me in a lot of ways. I, I placed myself pretty deliberately on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Armed Services Committee because I was interested in cybersecurity and pandemic specifically and, bi and biosecurity. Uh, and um, unfortunately, it ended up being a lot more important than I ever hoped that it would be in my very first term in Congress. You can talk to us a little bit about this year, and, and particularly towards the beginning, or last year, I suppose, 2020, when the pandemic was first breaking out, um, your initial thoughts about it, how were you getting information? And I'm always interested in how legislators keep themselves informed on things, because quite often you have to give an opinion very really rapidly quickly. in the yeah. moment, and mm -hmm. then you have to start making legislation in the moment. And that's been the essence of this pandemic, it seems like, is trying to understand it and act on it literally while it's unfolding every day. How have you approached that? It's a really um, a kind of astute and interesting question because you're right. I serve, as I mentioned, on um, the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committees and specifically asked to be on the Asia and Africa subcommittees, uh, respectively. Uh, that because uh, a lot of disease uh, and, and a lot of cyber issues uh, come out of Asia and come out of Africa. And so I was actually on one of the first, I think actually the first subcommittee hearing about the COVID pandemic in the Asia subcommittee of the Foreign Affairs uh, uh, Committee. And we had Dr. Redfield uh, talking to us about the pandemic at that point in time where I was asking questions. My line of questions was designed to try to put the public, the American public at ease at that point in time and asking about hand washing and mask wearing and whether we should be worried and whether we should to be um, locking people out and in. Uh, and at that point in time, we didn't have the information that we now have about uh, proper protocols and mask wearing and that sort of thing. And so his advice at that point of time, time was um, how we typically address uh, disease or have historically addressed disease. And that, of course, has evolved really radically over the last year and a half or so, where we are now much more aware of what this disease is and what we have on our hands and much more cognizant of what we individually need to do to, to stem the tide. So that's where I was. And I felt, uh, still do, uh, that it was really important that in my capacity, my role to make sure I was delivering truth and facts as rapidly as I was getting them. So we set up um, town halls, uh, virtual and Facebook town halls that we held very, very regularly, if not weekly, maybe more frequently than that, just calling in experts uh, that would talk to us about the disease, that would talk to us about our response to it, that would talk about mental health or schooling or any number of those kinds of things. Because my role is not only, as you mentioned, to legislate or to, you know, um, to convene, you know, hearings, but it is also to uh, bring relevant information and to educate my con my uh, constituency, and not to have all the answers. So I wanted to make sure that I was bringing real experts to the conversation. It, that uncertainty or not having all of the answers, literally as the science is unfolding in real time, seems to have provided an opening um, for disinformation throughout the year. Has that surprised you in any way, the degree to which things like masks have become politicized, the disinformation that's been out there in the system? That seems like an incredibly hard thing to legislate in, in the middle of that as well. It is. Um enormously aggravating and frustrating. It's incredibly irresponsible on the part of our leadership and our elected representatives to not uh, say and do the right things, the things that they know are the right things to say and do, which is to wear a mask, you know, as an example, or to be responsible. Uh, we can't necessarily control what the interwebs will do with information. A good example would be during that hearing that happened in the February or January timeframe, uh, I did ask uh, Dr. Redfield at the time, you know, should we wear masks? And his advice at the time was no. That was the advice yeah. at that time, of the, uh, at that moment. And that becomes, you know, a viral falsity. 
um, that you know perpetuates itself into all time. And that's you know something that you cannot control, frankly, in this environment. But what you can control is how you communicate as a leader and how you demonstrate by example as a leader. Uh, and that I think is something that I'm still to this moment frustrated by as recently as today when we found out that the third member of Congress who was under siege in the Capitol building now has tested positive for COVID because his colleagues, my colleagues, refused to wear a mask while they were um, hunkered down together in a, in a, in a bunker. I, I was going to ask you about that later, but since you brought it up, uh, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman is my representative. I live in, in New Jersey. Uh, she's enormously respected here. She's lovely, yeah. Um, I, it's hard for me to imagine how you're all going to go back to work together in this in this new Congress, but you're going to have to. It seems like it's made even harder now with this these realizations that people um, have taken or not taken steps to even keep each other safe in your workplace. Mm -hmm. It is hard. Um, I'm committed. I'm committed to bipartisan work. I'm committed to working across the aisle and to trying to find common ground. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a veteran. I grew up in a house of one Democrat and one Republican mom and dad. Right. And you know, uh, I know the importance of respecting difference and respecting difference of opinion and different policy ideas. Uh, I serve a community that is very purple too, partly red, partly blue. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I know that it's really important that um, despite our differences and disagreements that we try to find the places where we can agree. So to that end, I participate in something called the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is 25 Democrats and 25 Republicans who try to find our commonalities. And I also helped to found an organization called For Country, which is 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans who served in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have nothing in common other than that. In fact, ideologically, we are really uh, far apart from one another. But we're trying to uh, serve with civility and decency and lead by example. Uh, let's stay with this, the Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, what are some of the ideas you have going into this next Congress uh, that will benefit people in your district, but also nationally? <laughs> So some of the most recent work that we've done as a caucus is to try to come to the middle on the most recent round of stimulus uh, for COVID response. You may have seen that we started uh, in the May time frame at a $3 trillion price tag or so, and uh, lots of bells and whistles on that. And the April, I'm sorry, August time frame or so, that became $2 trillion. Uh, the problem solvers were really instrumental uh, coming together to create um, kind of a, a sliding scale, for lack of a better description, that somewhere that started somewhere a little bit south of a trillion and, and ratcheted up based on need to a little bit more than one and a half tr uh, trillion, and with a lot of the compromises that we all couldn't quite find our way to, uh, and so that was a good example of how um, a collaborative group, small group, can get together and push their leadership uh, to be able to say, "Listen, guys, we got to be able to find some common ground here. The people are suffering," uh, and I think that that's the kind of thing that. And I would hope to see us carry into the 117th Congress, um, where we now as Democrats, and I'm a Democrat, have a very, very uh, small margin uh, uh, of a majority, both in the mm -hmm. House and in the Senate. And of course, we have the White House. And that really means, above all, that we need to get along and that we need to work together with our Republican ally, uh, colleagues. And uh, more than ever, that we need to uh, address a mandate that I think the people gave us, which is get stuff done. Uh, mm -hmm. and knock it off. I think that those are the, the things that I was elected under. Right. So uh, stimulus will certainly be part of that. And as you were just discussing, what about rebuilding the health infrastructure of America? I mean, that's what to me has been revealed in this year, that it was it was already deteriorating and then it's been under assault by the executive branch. It seems like uh, members of Congress who can find ways to work together are going to have to get to work on that. What kind of ideas do you have in that regard? Well, I do think that one of the things that I've been most struck by in the pandemic is how interconnected that we are uh, and how interdependent that we are and how we probably should have already always known that. But this is now so much more obvious than we could ever have have dreamed of uh, your issue of question about health care. Now we understand why sick leave matters, right? Now we understand why child care, parental leave and, and family leave matters. We understand why it matters that all of us have quality, affordable access to health care. Um, because my health matters for your health. 
um, and that I can have all the things going for me. But if you don't, you're going to possibly make me less healthy and we are going to collectively as a society be less successful. So I think as a consequence of that exposure in, in the space of healthcare and similar exposures in education and education equity and um, and exposures and things like access to workplace uh, jobs, you know, broadband and things like that, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we are are uh, taking the infrastructure that we already have in healthcare and shoring it up. I believe that there's a lot of destruction that's happened to the um, uh, Obamacare uh, that can be um, un un undone. But I also believe that there's a lot of uh, work that we can do to provide a public option alongside that so that more people can have access to healthcare. We have a ton of work to do to make sure that uh, prescription drugs are more affordable. But we've also seen why it's really remarkable and important that we have such fine scientists and such fine technology that's able to be so agile and so quick to be able to get us something like a vaccine in the time frame that we've had. So we now also know why basic research matters and funding, you know, scientists and engineers matter. So we have a lot of good lessons to learn from this. You have some hope that the anti-science uh, fervor that has been too much part of the national conversation can subside in this time? I mean, can, can Congress do things? Can individual representatives like yourself, you talked about ways you can lead by telling the truth, which shouldn't be controversial, but I appreciate your <laughs> statement in that regard. Yeah. Um, but that's that's something that I think anybody who's studying this pandemic is very anxious about. How long will it take to repair public trust in science? Or uh, in diplomacy or in, you know, um, the infrastructure and um, uh, aspects of our government, like the FBI and that sort of thing. Um, we have a lot of work to do to rebuild trust in our institutions and in our um, people who have knowledge. And part of the work that I'm doing um, relates to that to some degree. Uh, I'm obviously a woman. Uh, I was at one point a girl. And so one of the things that I'm also focused on is STEM and STEAM and women and girls uh, and making sure that we're building a really strong and robust pipeline to have a more inclusive um, STEM and STEAM uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, I also include in that underserved community of women and girls, uh, communities of color too. Mm -hmm. We're going to really need a whole heck of a lot of people who have a lot of uh, skills, uh, STEM and STEAM skills, to be able to address the evolving um, economy that we are in and that we will be heading into. So yeah, I think we have some concerns and reasons for concern over people's approach and attitudes towards the importance of education and the importance of um, knowledge and the importance of science. Um, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to overcome that. And maybe to your point, we might be able to overcome that having now seen how powerful it is to be um, able to be a, pro uh, a producer of a vaccine or how important our first responders and doctors and nurses and, and paramedics and all, all of those kinds of people are. And all that requires um, respect for science and truth. I want to remind people that you're listening to COVID calls, and I'm doing my first of the congressional COVID calls discussions today with Representative Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania's 6th District. Uh, Representative, I want to ask you um, about your district. Uh, and, you know, Pennsylvania is a microcosm of the nation. Your district is a microcosm in many ways of Pennsylvania. It's urban, it's rural, it's suburban. Can you talk to us a little bit about what this past year was like? for your district, I'm sure it was hard, but what were some of the um, real areas of concern, uh, industries that were hit hardest, communities that were hit hardest, and, and how were you able to, to meet those needs? So I, in addition to being a vet and an engineer, I'm also an entrepreneur and have spent a lot of time in my community and in the Philadelphia area building businesses in our in our area, both nonprofit and for-profit businesses. And so when uh, the pandemic hit, the first thought should be, you know, the businesses, right? These are the, the jobs creators. These are the places where we will be able to keep people employed, uh, keep people with in our in our current system on healthcare, keep people um, kind of food secure as a consequence. All of those kinds of things. And so our team uh, reimagined, redesigned ourselves, went from being more aligned as an organization towards those committees that we've been talking about, and more organized around small business response 
individual and employment um, demands and response and uh, other kinds and uh, a disease response. And we were very much uh, reorganized as a, as a group, uh, as a team to do that. And so those were some of the first things that we did is kind of re reorganize, reimagine ourselves into those silos. Because what we did see pretty darn quickly is, you know, kind of what you talked about all kinds of businesses, small and mid and large size, and we have all of them, you know, were really affected by the pandemic. Some were able to pivot to work at home, you know, situations. Some couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, some were uh, nonprofits and, you know, were trying to figure out how do they, you know, survive. And of course, some of the legislative help that we were able to deliver focused on the fact that we needed to redefine what uh, where aid would go on a on mm -hmm. jobs bis uh, basis and redefine what unemployment was, you know, when people were being laid off. So that's where some of our first thoughts were. Then, you know, we talk about um, the, the, th the family, we need to, the, the schools were instantly affected as well. Um, that meant that not only were children no longer learning in the way that they've historically learned, but that meant that uh, childcare uh, and the ability to work was no longer the same as it had been historically. I'm again, you know, woman, girl, mom, um, had all of those uh, experiences of struggling to figure out how to piece it all together in a good situation. Right. Uh, if, if you're paying attention to the jobs report that just came out, you saw that we just lost a hundred and something thousand jobs this month. And at least the data I saw, which I still am questioning, said that they were all women. I find that hard to believe that there, it was 100% women. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's kind of how our community responded. We are just like everybody else. You know, we have, as you mentioned, suburbs and, and rural areas, mushroom farms and dairy farms. We have an urban center in, in Reading uh, and in Westchester. And uh, we have 10% roughly unemployment still at this time. And we're working hard to keep it together. And I think that what I very much admire about my community is we're super respectful of one another. And um, we are very pragmatic and we have worked hard to, to hold it together as long as we have. The other disaster that uh, was revealed this year had to do with the slow disaster of racism in America. And I mm -hmm. wonder if we could talk a little bit about that, how your community responded to the uh, death of George Floyd, um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that happened throughout the spring and the summer. I mean, history was being made literally every day in this country and in your district throughout that time. How did how did it strike you? What was your reaction? How did you keep the community together? How did you work with community leaders during that time? So um, what is interesting, and you're a historian, so I'd be interested in your perspective on this, is had this not happened when we were largely siloed and bunkered in our homes, you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and you know, of course, this has been happening for centuries, but had these particular uh, events not happened when we were relatively speaking quiet and had the mind space to be able to look and watch and open our ears and open our eyes, I don't think we would have had the epiphany that so many of mm. our community had to to say, wow, you know, this is this is real and Black Lives Matter. Uh, and until we address these issues, uh, we we can't hope that we will have a, a perfect union. And I was really, again, enormously proud of my community uh, that we recognize those kinds of things. Uh, had things like um, marches in in places like, and if you're from the area, you know, if I say the words Paoli uh, and yeah. um, Berwyn, you will know that those are places that are not historically yeah. hotbeds of activism, um, but they are and, and were at that point in time. And so I think just like everything else we've talked about, that this time is is tragic and, and, and very, very scary, but it's a real opportunity to uh, have the scales fall <laughs> from our eyes and recognize that there's so much work that we need to do to acknowledge the disparity between how black and brown families navigate this this world and how they are disproportionately impacted by uh, things like COVID. We're almost up on time. I just want to ask you um, what's happening in the House of Representatives today, today. What's going to, and what's going to happen, do you think, between now and, and Election Day? I, I, historians, it's malpractice to talk about the future, but I can ask other people about the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I cannot predict the future, um, but I can tell you that this evening uh, we will be taking a vote um, encouraging, it's a resolution, so it doesn't 
effectively do anything, but encouraging the vice president and the cabinet to implement uh, the 25th Amendment, which would remove the president from office. Uh, gives him effectively 24 hours to respond to that. And I and others would encourage him to do that. I also frankly would encourage this president to, to resign uh, because I think that that would be healing and, the, and frankly the right thing for him to do. Short of that, if neither of those things happen, the next step in the House and the body that I serve in will be uh, an article of impeachment that will be introduced tomorrow that focuses uh, very narrowly on the events of last week, on the events of January 6th and the president's role in that. That will be brought to the floor for a vote, up or down vote. I would expect that would pass um, because there is a majority of Democrats and I believe that you will probably be surprised that some Republicans will come along on that too. What happens from there is anybody's guess. At that point in time, it may or may not make its way to the Senate floor, and I don't have any real understanding or knowledge of with what timeline that could happen on. Um, but I, I believe my, that my duty uh, is to, to observe and respect and uphold my oath. And I believe that that is my part of this um, ecosystem to, to work in that way. Representative Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania's 6th District, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID Calls, and thanks for your leadership. You're welcome. Thank you, and please be safe. Thanks. Okay, a good start to our COVID Calls congressional discussions, and we have more of those coming this week, including Pennsylvania Senator Bob Casey on Thursday, and more coming throughout the month. I'd like to now turn to bringing some humanity to the startling numbers that we're seeing about the pandemic at this time. And to do that, I'd like to read an obituary. And that's how we'll close out today's COVID calls. Andrew C. Andy Phillips aged 53, died May 31st, 2020. He was a resident of Chester Springs, Pennsylvania. And this is an obituary that was published by the Dan Jalel Memorial Home. After a hard fought, brave battle with COVID-19, Andy passed away peacefully with his family by his side at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania on May 31st, 2020 at the age of 53. Sadly, he leaves behind the love of his life, his wife, Trish Phillips, McDonna, their daughter, Grace Phillips, and their sons, Colin, Aiden, and Andrew Phillips. He is also survived by his beloved mother, Joan Phillips Powers, his treasured sister, Donna Karsnick, and her son, Brandon Karsnick. He is preceded in death by his father, Donald Phillips, who also tragically lost his battle to COVID-19 on April 28th. 2020. Andy was born on May 23rd, 1967 in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. He grew up playing basketball, football, and baseball. Andy went to Upper Darby High School where he excelled in the classroom and on his varsity teams. After high school, Andy attended and graduated from Drexel University in 1990, achieving honors in a double major of finance and marketing. He was also a proud member of the Greek chapter Tau Kappa Epsilon. Andy married the love of his life, Trish, on November 18th, 1995. Together, they raised their four beautiful children in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Andy was a doting husband and a devoted father. The center of Andy's world was Trish and the children. He loved being an active part of the children's lives, whether it was coaching their basketball teams, attending every one of their games, and cheering with passion from the sidelines. Andy adored his many friends and enjoyed spending time with them, whether at a favorite restaurant or cheering on his favorite Philadelphia Eagles after a fun tailgate with lifelong friends. He cherished his special beach days on 58th Street in Ocean City, New Jersey with his family. Andy was a fabulous cook and recently he started growing vegetables and herbs in a neighborhood garden. A perfect night for Andy was creating a special meal with his family and enjoying a cocktail with Trish. And he also loved a great concert and shared a passion for all music. He was an avid dog lover as well. Over 20 years ago, when Trish and Andy were young parents, Andy was diagnosed with an advanced form of Hodgkin's lymphoma. He heroically beat the cancer 
Battling through his chemo, radiation, and challenging treatments, his oncologist, Dr. Sandy Schnall of BHM, and radiation oncologist, Dr. Eli Glatstein of Penn, remained his lifelong physicians and close friends. Andy was a classically trained salesperson who excelled early in his career and quickly advanced to executive leadership roles in sales and business development. After positions at Johnsville and Bon Grain Cheese USA, Andy was recruited to Franklin Foods Incorporated. His career afforded him the opportunities to visit many places throughout the world, including Japan, South Korea, Germany, and France. Not only did the people he worked with love him, he loved being with them and traveling to see him. Later, Andy leveraged his passion and expertise to launch his own consulting company, Excel Food Group. Andy was thoughtful, full of energy, and smart. He was very respected by his colleagues and customers. The family wrote that they're grateful to all who have supported Andy and his family throughout his two-month heroic battle in the ICU with COVID-19. Whether it was countless prayers shared, delicious meals delivered, or the many acts of kindness displayed, they said, we are so thankful. To the brave frontline staff at Chester County Hospital and at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, thank you for doing all you could to help Andy. We will never forget your tireless, compassionate care. Even though as a family, we were not able to visit Andy for most of his time spent in the hospital due to the visitor restrictions that came along with the virus, we never felt he was alone because of your amazing dedication to his healing. To know Andy Phillips was to love Andy Phillips. He will be forever treasured and never forgotten. Andy Phillips died May 31st, 2020. He was a resident of Chester Springs, Pennsylvania, Chester County. I want to thank again my guest today, Representative in the U.S. House of Representatives, Chrissy Houlihan, Representative of Pennsylvania's 6th District, for the conversation that uh, we had. And it was great to hear about her efforts in her district and how she's looking ahead to trying to fight the pandemic this year. You can catch COVID calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And tomorrow we're gonna to be talking again about vaccines and vaccination. My guests will be the writer Tara Hayel and social scientist Maya Goldenberg. Please join me for that tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time. And please do mark your calendar Thursday, 5 p.m. for my discussion with Pennsylvania Senator Bob Casey. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow, five o'clock.